our session because uh, I'm not sure with, uh, whatever all the authors of the papers uh, will eventually, yeah? But actually our session consists of two parts, but the second part should, uh, should end at 17.20 instead of 18.35 because we are followed by another panel. So there is a mistake in this uh, schedule, so we must uh, stick uh, um, to, to our schedule, so I think uh, 20 minutes for, for a paper would be enough. Okay, personally, I will try to not to run out of time. Uh, so, uh, a few words about myself. I'm Petra Skopsova. I teach at uh, St. Petersburg State University. Uh, I'm a linguist by profession, so, uh, so my talk will be mostly about linguistics. I draw, anyway, I draw on linguistic data what we can get from it. So the title of the paper is, uh, as you can see, the formation and transformation of social stereotypes. And I will be speaking about two different social stereotypes. Uh, the, those are labor migrant stereotype and refugees stereotype. And um, so I will be actually speaking about two different conceptions of others, yes? So actually all our session will be about the stereotyping of others uh, and uh, so we have much in common between our papers uh, but it happens that in the Russian in the current Russian context there are two different social stereotypes of, of uh, others okay so um, so the aims of the paper are the following one so first I'm going to tackle the labor migrant stereotype and uh, in including changes that this stereotype has undergone over the past years. Because uh, um, about 10 years ago, I did a similar research on the labor migrant stereotype, and now I'm back to this topic and I'd like to identify some changes. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to speak about the uh, newly born stereotype of refugees from Ukraine. And finally, I'm going to compare these two stereotypes of others. So, uh, just a few extra linguistic facts about labor migration in Russia. Uh, so, according to the United Nations International Migration Report, we currently, uh, not currently, but in 2013, yes, the number of international migrants in Russia was estimated at 11 million. Uh, and these figures agree with those provided with, by the Russian Federal Migration Service. Uh, but the Russian Federal Migration Service uh, also adds up that more than 90% of them are unregistered. Uh, if we look at the uh, countries of origin of these international migrants, and leave out the Ukraine, because I'm leaving it out because well, actually, Ukrainians are very similar to Russians, both in, uh, in their appearance and uh, in their culture and in their language. We can see that the other four countries that, and among the top five countries are those uh, of Central Asia. And um, uh, these migrants actually, um, they, so these uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. They account for more than one third of the total number of international migrants in Russia. And uh, unlike Ukrainians, they look different from the Russians and thus attract attention and thus um, actually are a, the group which gives rise to this stereotype. And here are some pictures just to, to give you an idea of how they look like and how they, they are different from Russians. Yes. So, uh, okay. Uh, so, the migrant worker stereotype, worker stereotype. So, uh, here are major constituents of this stereotype as identified in my previous paper. So, different appearance, culture, religion, and language, as I have already uh, said. Uh, readiness to work for a much lower fee than normally paid to Russians. Uh, why it is highlighted, I will explain later. Then, next come traditional um, issues concerning immigration, like crime and violence, and ethnic tension, increase in Muslim population. Uh, next comes lack of qualification and professional skills for knowledge of the Russian language. 
again, a very traditional component, a burden on uh, national social programs. And finally, outpouring of money from Russia to Central Asia, which means that the migrants uh, make their best to spend as little as they can in Russia and to transfer all money to, to their homeland. Um, so, um, an, an interesting thing is that uh, this uh, second component uh, uh, original was was very prominent. Uh, it has been always emphasized that labor migrants are eager to get any job that would pay and are willing to work hard for little money. Uh, and some people praised them for that, uh, and others pointed out that it increased unemployment among the local population. But anyway, originally this component was was a very prominent one. But uh, I must say that nowadays its salience has diminished. And uh, um, many respondents actually point out that a new generation of immigrants has arrived, motivated more by a desire for the good life than by the need to earn money. And they are no longer humble, um, downtrodden, uh, but rather joyful, relaxed, well fed, well clad. And they, they are young people with brand new mobiles, uh, which uh, uh, have already adjusted to the urban way of life. They attend shopping malls, fitness halls, recreation centers, cafes, and so on. Uh, so I have highlighted this component to mark the change. And actually, uh, this is the change I have identified with the stereotype of migrants, migrant workers. If we look at the discourse features, uh, um, the discourse about about labor migrants, uh, we can see that it is uh, it is based on the opposition as them, um, and this opposition, as we all know, um, presupposes positive portrayal of Russian citizens and negative portrayal of labor migrants. This is trivial enough, and perhaps it didn't need mentioning, but what's interesting, I will show in the next slide, so I'll switch to the next slide and then get back to this one. Uh, so this opposition us them uh, is uh, reflected in metaphors, uh, but uh, you can see that when uh, it deals with migrants, uh, many metaphors are used which dehumanize migrants. So we say we like blood of migrants, influx of migrants, tank of migrants. Look, but here are Russian examples of Russian. Uh, so, um, but when uh, it deals with the portraying us, yes, our country, Russia, uh, it is uh, on the opposite. Uh, Russia is personified. So Russia is presented as donor, breastfeeding mother, it is hospitable, it is friendly, open, and so on. So what we actually have is uh, that uh, uh, humans are portrayed as uh, non-living entities, actually as a, some impersonal mass, uh, while uh, the country, which is impersonal, which is non-living entity, it is, on the contrary, personified, and it is, it is, it is very interesting how these metaphors, uh, polar metaphors, actually are used. Uh, and it is by no means, these metaphors are by no means uh, uh, accidental, uh, because uh, dehumanizing migrants uh, helps to present them as some inorganic mass, and uh, uh, so that you know you can't feel you can't sympathize with inorganic mass. And uh, on the contrary, Russia is uh, presented as uh, as a human being, and uh, this um, actually um, uh, brings uh, forth the issue of victimization. So presenting Russian Russian citizens as victims. Uh, and this idea is gaining support over the past decade among the political leaders of different orientation and general public opposition. 
So I'm getting back now to the previous slide just to give a few comments on the other discourse features. So uh, so that was for metaphors of personification and depersonification. Okay. Uh, but then we, we find traditional metaphors, traditional for any discourse on immigration, I guess, metaphors uh, of wild animals, disease, and the invasion and occupation, uh, which uh, instantiates again this opposition of us, them, in form of guests and hosts. Uh, another uh, feature, discourse feature of uh, when the discourse is about labor migrants is the use of the values and adjectives. So again, I have highlighted it to mark the, the change that seems to have taken place. Uh, in, Ten years ago, uh, I pointed out that the discussion of labor migrants in mass media often involved the use of emotionally laden terms. So uh, in speaking about migrants, journalists, as well as government officials and politicians, uh, would freely employ such evaluative oppositions as necessary, unnecessary, desirable, undesirable, useful, useless, harmful, and even good might bad migrants. So, for instance, uh, the former mayor of Moscow, Yuri Lushkov, uh, was pondering over the question, publicly pondering over the question whether uh, migrants are um, evil or good, hell. Yeah, and finally came to the conclusion that it is an evil hell. And it was uh, limitless in public discourse. But uh, nowadays, Actually, these uh, evaluative uh, terms uh, uh, are no longer commonly in use, and uh, I mean in official discourse. And uh, on the one hand, this is uh, definitely a positive change because uh, it is uh, uh, making uh, official language more politically correct. But on the other hand, uh, the gap between official public discourse and informal everyday communication uh, has widened. But anyway, this is a this is a change, and I have highlighted it. Um, yes, we have already seen it. Now, now uh, we have come to the second reading of the paper uh, to speak about the remedies the uh, Again, some extra linguistic. Nation. So in the year of 2014, uh, witnessed a large scale immigration from Ukraine to Russia, mostly from the eastern parts of Ukraine. And uh, according to the date of the Federal Migration Service, uh, as of January 2015, there are in Russia there are more than 800,000 refugees in Russia, but actually. Um, Many sources say that uh, the, these figures uh, perhaps are not uh, correct and the real numbers are much higher. So, um, Russian authorities are taking pains to proportionally distribute refugees among the Russian regions and, in particular, to send them to the sparsely populated North and Far East. Uh, refugees or the, in their turn uh, make their best to stay in the Russian regions which are close to their former homes. And this clash of interest gives rise to the general feeling of discontent and resentment. So uh, uh, actually what we have can be presented in the form of a triangle where we have refugees, local population and Russian authorities. And um, uh, uh, I can say that there is, uh, actually when you analyze this course, uh, you can see that there is much tension and dissatisfaction along each leg of this triangle. Uh, so uh, the refugees complain that they are neglected and cannot get what they were promised by, by the Russian government. They protest against the attempts of the authorities to move them to the faraway places preferring to stay in the already overpopulated adjacent regions. The Russian civil officers and volunteers who assist them in their turn say uh, that they often come across rudeness, thanklessness, and excessively high demands. 
the local population, the writers, the newcomers, the money we get from the Russian budget for free, and are indignant at their parasitic behavior. So they claim that the idle newcomers enjoy a lifestyle that the hardworking locals cannot afford. Okay, so we again, uh, so this, this tension I'm not, uh, in this triangle, I mean, it gives rise to uh, the opposition as them, uh, to, to um, several oppositions. Okay, so this opposition is instantiated in different ways. But the main opposition is, I mean, in Russian discourse is we locals, they refugees. And um, this negative portrayal of the refugees is affected again in the user orientation and application metaphors and a wide array of retaliatory terms. But besides, there is the, in the Russian public discourse, this opposition of we refugees, the Russian authorities can also be traced but uh, I will not enlarge on it. Uh, so, so here are the basic components of the refugee stereotype as far as I could identify them because uh, this stereotype is yet under formation. Uh, so as I have already mentioned, kind of some success in the high demand, I don't know, parasitic lifestyle. But uh, of course, this, this is the feature of the stereotype. So, uh, and uh, um, it is, uh, uh, it, uh, I mean, it doesn't apply to each and every person, uh, but there are certainly the so-called professional refugees, and I guess they, are, they can be seen in almost all European countries. And uh, this uh, subcategory actually substitutes for the category of refugees in general, this is what uh, Lakoff in his famous book, I mean, Empire and Dangerous Things, called metonymic cognitive models. Uh, another feature is cowardice in, and desertion, because uh, 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 the Russians consider male refugees cowards and deserters, because instead of fighting for separation and independence for the Ukraine, they set out from the start to make welfare claims in Russia. And finally, what is again, uh, I think, a, a, an important component of this uh, newly born stereotype, uh, positive presentation of Russia and its population. So Russia and its people are presented as active benefactors uh, who disinterestedly help newcomers with food, money, shelter, job offers, and so on. So, the third part of my story, where I try to compare these stereotypes in terms of migrant workers and refugees. And I have listed everything we have previously seen. And what is interesting uh, is that there are, you can see that there are uh, very many blank spaces, which means that the components have no counterparts. And actually what we have is only three areas of um, correspondence, of overlap. And I will comment on them in the next slide. So these three areas are, so what is common? So what uh, this area of coincidence is the burden on the Russian budget. So you can see it's uh, uh, this uh, in between this. Uh, burden on the Russian budget, burden on social problems. Uh, well, there, there is some difference, but I, I don't think this is significant. The difference is that the migrants use uh, the Russian healthcare because they dream about their pregnant wives and wives speak perfect in Russia and the children go to Russian schools, uh, whereas uh, the refugees are directly helped with money. Like, they get money from the Russian budget, but anyway, this burden on the Russian budget is common, is a common thing. Another uh, area of overlap is presentation of Russia. But here we have difference. So uh, I have already said that uh, in case of the refugees, Russia is considered an active benefactor. So it plays an active role in helping them. Uh, um, in, uh, with migrants, 
uh, the, the role of Russia is not as prominent because um, migrants come to Russia on their own. Uh, nobody invites them. Nobody uh, actually. But uh, I have already, I have also said that uh, if Russia comes into the picture, it is often presented as as a victim. So uh, so it is. I mean, this component is uh, is about Russia. It's about the image of. Russia in this opposition as them, yes, but uh, it is, again, it is a different image, so. Uh, and the third area of overlap is uh, uh, that of contrast. So um, while uh, with migrant workers, uh, this component still remains and is rather strong, this readiness to work hard for, for little money, um, uh, refugees are claimed to be idle and parasitic. So, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, and locals occupy, local population, Russian population occupies a in between position in, between how they migrants and how they refugees. So, actually, uh, I have come to the, to the end of the story, but. To, what I'd like to say at the end is that um, stereotypes are being formed and transformed, and uh, uh, I think that personally for me that is not the, the end of the story because it turned out to be interesting to trace it, to get back to it after after a decade and perhaps in a few years I'll be back on it again and see whether these uh, stereotypes uh, perhaps uh, become closer to one another. I don't believe that they will totally merge, but, but still it will be interesting to see how, how it works. So, so thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, if there are any questions, I think we can afford five minutes for, for questions and answers. Yes. I just want to ask you what was the database? Oh, sorry, I didn't. Uh, yes, that was uh, data taken from the internet, both from uh, mass media and from personal blogs. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you presented these four groups from Central Asia. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not familiar with the Russian discourse, but the, the, the Chechens are, for instance, the group they're most stereotyped, um, or, or why did you leave them out? Or? Because, uh, because you know, Chechen, Chech, uh, Chechens are um, in the Russian Federation, so they are not international migrants, and uh, yeah, they are not, sorry, they're not in the category. Yeah. Although there is much internal migration uh, in Russia, but it is not uh, accounted for. It. Now, that wouldn't be my question. Um, the internal migration, does it cause any types of, you know, like, change of stereotypes? I mean, it happens in different countries, or like, it was in Germany, for example. The change of stereotypes? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if some, I don't know, modern Russians move to the south, that, con if that causes a conflict, for example. Within Russia? Mm -hmm. Not, not that I know of. Well, there is a problem, of course, with northern focuses, but um, I mean, they, they are not normally uh, labeled uh, migrants. So it's, uh, it's rather difficult to, uh, to identify this discourse in the debate. But would they move? Are they like very ah. displaced people? Like, do they move? Do they move uh, within Russia? Mm -hmm. Of course they do, yes. All right, thank you. So uh, now I'm giving the floor to Irina Svenyuk, uh, who will perhaps say a few words about herself. So,